Welcome, everyone. This is the 12th episode, can't believe it, of the Real Emergency Vodcast. Today, we're going to be focusing on a few pediatric cases that will truly get you thinking. Um, Real Emergency is produced in partnership with Hanteavy, Real DX, and 410 Medical, and is powered by Prodigy EMS. I am Hillary Gates, Director of Educational Strategy for Prodigy EMS. I want you to know that all of our episodes, past episodes, are available to you for CAPC credit on Prodigy. And be sure to look at our Twitter page and our Facebook page. And again, as I said, all of our episodes are not only available for CE, on Prodigy, but are also available on YouTube. Let me start by introducing our resident experts. We have David Spiro, who is a pediatric emergency physician and professor at the University of Arkansas Medical System. He is also the chief medical officer of RealDX. Peter Antevi is a pediatric emergency medicine physician, EMS physician, and founder of Pediatric Emergency Standards Incorporated. Mark Peel is a pediatric intensivist at WakeMed in Raleigh, North Carolina, and is a medical director with WakeMed Mobile Critical Care. Dr. Peel is also founder and chief medical officer of 410 Medical. Zach Dunlap is a critical care paramedic and works as a clinical education specialist for 410 Medical. So some tips for watching today, if you haven't been with us before, we do want you to weigh in. We want to hear from you, and the panelists will ask for your feedback. You can unmute your mic and chime in, uh, keep your camera on, or write questions in the chat, and we can uh, use that as a jumping off point for discussion. Today, you're going to be viewing footage of a few different pediatric cases, because after all, when you have three docs who specialize in peds, you should probably take advantage of their expertise. We all know that these little guys are ones we don't see very frequently and cases that sometimes concern us a bit. So we picked some um, syndromes and conditions that we can really learn from, including how they're managed in the hospital when we transport them. So I think if I'm reading my notes correctly, it looks like we're doing something along the lines of a maybe a, a football injury, pediatric interception, intersus into susception, excuse me. That'll be the hardest word you have today. Can you try to say that, it three please? times fast. Into susception. We'll have a spelling test at the end. You can't get CE unless you pass the spelling test. Let's get started. Over to you, Peter, Mark, David, and Zach. Yeah, well, I just want to say, you know, it's funny. You said it's this, this is the 12th episode. It's just, I can't believe it. And, uh, First of all, it's an honor to, uh, to be working with you, Hillary, Mark, Peter, and everyone, Maya. And, you know, this has been a really interesting uh, journey, and uh, it's been organic and fun. And um, every single episode, every single episode, I have learned something and has made me a better doc and a better teacher. And uh, today we're going to learn something. And, you know, I can't wait to learn from Mark. Mark has some great content. And, Peter and, uh, but most importantly, we want to hear from y'all. And I can say that as a New Yorker, because I've spent seven or eight years in the South. So I do say y'all sometimes. And uh, I want I want everyone to be interactive. So it's really, really important for folks to be either chatting or if you want to un unmute yourself and um, say something, we, we want to hear from you because you may have something really important to say that we can learn because this is bi-directional learning. And this is totally different than, um, you know, anyone just coming up and just lecturing. We want this to be completely interactive and fun. Um, but I do want to mention one thing is that, <clears throat> you know, Dr. Peel and I, when we were preparing for this, we want to, we want everyone to know that the children that, and, and uh, the patients you're going to see, uh, their families all signed consent forms and they've consented to allow for this video. And the first thing I always mention when I talk about this is I'm very thankful for those families and those patients that allow us to learn uh, from these experiences because they're giving of themselves uh, to, to learn. So I just wanna say thank you to them. And I wanted to set this up saying, um, this is a little different than some of our previous episodes. And we wanted to highlight in kids some of the subtle signs of potentially life-threatening uh, illnesses uh, you're going to see. And, and in kids, and I think in the elderly too, there are often s very subtle signs of, of, uh, of potentially life-threatening conditions. So that's what you're going to see here. We'll talk them through. We'd welcome your input. Peter, Mai, anybody else want to give any uh, opening thoughts before we start? 
Yeah, uh, Mark and David, thank you so much. Uh, the, the comment I'll make is, you know, yesterday I had a medical director meeting with, with my crews and, I, and th there's one thing that I think until today still I miss, which is those subtle signs, as you mentioned, of sepsis or shock early on, they can fool you because your eyes are seeing something, but what's going on beneath the skin is very different. And so I, I think that hopefully these cases will, will demonstrate that. So uh, thank you guys. Really looking forward to these videos. Great. Let's let's roll the first case. Um, this is a um, infant presenting with abdominal pain uh, or some sort of pain crisis uh, to the mother. All right. So we're here today with Allison's mom. This is this is Allison. She's not feeling very well right now. Mom, can you tell me what what started today? Um, she just she had been fine all day, and then. All of a sudden, she would have bouts of like, I mean, it was kind of like she was throwing a temper tantrum. Mm -hmm. She could tell she was in a lot of pain and something wasn't right. Um, and she had been having a lot of bowel movements throughout the day. Um, so that's what, whenever she was in a lot of pain is when I decided to bring her in. Was she constantly in pain or did it come and go in, in kind of episodes? It would come and go in episodes. She would be able to be soothed, soothed for like a few minutes and then she would just start screaming again okay and how old is she now she is a year old okay okay so we just played 10 15 seconds into this is this child sick or not sick is this child someone that you're extremely worried about right this second are you not um thoughts comments david what time of the day is this do you happen to know that yeah it's 11 a.m so she's been, she's been, her, her sleep pattern is completely off uh, and uh, had, a, had a really difficult time uh, sleeping the night before. Okay. Yeah, because one, one of my golden rules in the emergency department is no one ever leaves my emergency department asleep. And so when you find a kid in your emergency department sleeping, they should not be sleeping, right? And so I think that's, at least for me, I mean, who the hell can sleep in an ER? I don't know. And so when okay. you find that, it's a, that's a bad sign for me. It's funny, you have that rule that's a real, and I'm gonna learn from that, that I've never thought of it that way. My rule actually is no one leaves the emergency department unless I can make that, and also come in later, unless they can walk. I always make my, my, my patients walk, because oftentimes I'll come into the ER and they'll be in a gurney. And if you're a paramedic and, you know, uh, your EMS crews come and they're already on a gurney. I know that sometimes you may not make them walk, but knowing if a child can walk can be very helpful uh, in, in this setting. If you're a paramedic in the ER, you know, that's a, that's a little bit of a pearl. What position is this child in? And is this a normal position? Let's just continue it, but just think about it. Look at the position of this child. And she she looks like she likes sitting in that position. Is that the case? Yes, she likes her legs to be kind of tucked up to her belly uh -huh. and just kind of laid over. Has she been sick in any other way? Any runny nose or fever or anything like that? He has not had a runny nose or fever. Any vomiting? Um, yes, she threw up twice when we got to the hospital. Okay. Any other medical problems for Allison? Um, she had MRSA um, and now, this will come in later, but my feedback to this provider, who's a close friend of mine, uh, I would have I've asked the second question after vomiting, what color is it? And we'll, we'll Dr. Peel will talk about that later, but I would have loved to have known what color is the vomiting? Is it is it just formula or milk or is it yellow or green or what color green or what shade of green? But we'll talk about that in a second. Sick or not sick? What do you guys think? Add in your chats. That surgically um, from her jaw and abscess, and other than that, no. Okay, thank you, Mom. Everybody's weighing on the side of sick there, David. Um, definitely, uh, and you know, we're really curious about um, this position that the child is in, as well as um, the fact that she's sleeping. Uh, as Peter said, who can sleep in an ER? Okay, so so it's important to write things down in medical records. So what? What position is this child in? Is this child supine or prone, right? This kid is prone. And, and what about the hips? This is really, really important. Don't forget this presentation. Don't forget how this child looks when this child comes in. This child is prone 
with the hips flexed and I ask that question, and this is the position of comfort for this child. This is a position uh, of comfort. So I'm gonna just stop this really quickly. And um, Mark, Peter, any uh, my any thoughts, comments? So just real quickly, the vital signs, the child is afebrile, uh, the heart rate's 130, uh, respiratory rate's 36, and SATs are 99% and is coming in again with this episodic uh, pain and, and vomiting. Uh, David, Gordon, what about perfusion, cap refill? Cap refill was, was, was two seconds. The one comment I'll make, and I think this is a really important part about the, the history taking, this person who's speaking, and I, I don't know who it is, but he, he, he clearly uh, knows the right questions to ask, right? And I think a lot of times what I find is that if you don't know the right questions to ask, you'll never get the answers to those questions. And so he was kind of asking earlier, is this episodic or not? And how her position is and is she vomiting? And I think all that will become more clear in a minute, but knowing the types of questions to ask for certain age kids is very, very important. I thought he did a great job there. Maya, anyone else want to comment? On I was gonna say that, yeah, I was gonna say, I think that this is like such a good example of, you know, Lots of the times in the hospital, we have the tests that confirm what we already think based on taking a really thorough history and an assessment. And there are some diagnoses, right, where our probability of that diagnosis is like extraordinarily high based on the clinical history and what the parents are telling us alone. And there's times like that child looks, right, like somewhat sick. She's sleeping. She looks like she feels unwell. Overall, like even the vital signs and stuff are reassuring, but we don't, we can't be fully reassured by things like, oh, the vital signs are normal because there's lots of very bad things where the vital signs are nearly normal or normal. Um, but the clinical history itself is extraordinarily concerning. And that's why our ability to get that history out of the mom and ask the right questions is key because, right? The, the diagnostic momentum that sort of comes forward, even from the pre-hospital component, if you can provide those questions early on, you increase like the suspicion for bad illness, even if on the triage board, it says belly pain with normal vital signs, which may actually delay assessment of a child um, in an otherwise busy emergency department, who you can say is sick based on the clinical history that you've taken. Well, and as you become a more seasoned paramedic, depending on what location you're at, that, that may change where you send the child because uh, I, a child like this that goes to a community ER uh, that doesn't have uh, certain resources may need to be transferred. So you may be able, be able to save uh, another transport for the child if, if, uh, if you're in a certain region that you have options. So. Dave, David, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna kind of jump off what Maya said, but I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna play devil's advocate here. What if you came into this house, it's a little late at night, the kid looks like she's sleeping, you do the vital signs. I would, I would say that there are some people who would say to the mom, hey, have you seen your doctor yet? And do the old kind of like the refusal language a little bit here, right? So yeah. I, I, I do think that the history, because I mean, we haven't even done a physical yet, right? All we see is a girl laying kind of in the fetal position on a bed. You've given us some vital signs. And you're already, you're already showing us some like a diagnostic something or other that we're about to see. So um, I I want to I want to really you know say that what Maya said is very important is that we we kind of already know in our minds what we want to do because we've asked the right questions and that's really the important part of this. And that's why we're all here today. So um, I just want to highlight that because you're going to leave in the next forty five minutes. You're going to have knowledge that you didn't have before. Um, yes, and yes. this and I, you'll I, catch it next time. Yeah. So I just want to say to Peter's point, anytime you came near this child and touched the belly, the kid started crying and became inconsolable for three or four minutes and then went back into that prone position with the hips flexed. So that's what you would see on an exam. But to your point, Peter, one of the things that I really pay attention to is what the parent is saying, assuming the parent's not psychotic. Um, if the parent seems relatively normal and tells me, this is not my kid, something's not right. I've been living with this kid for 12 months. Everything's been fine and predictable. And the last 12 hours, there's something wrong with my kid. I pay attention to that. I just do. Um, so real quickly, uh, I, 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 I uh, am gonna 
say this. This is I, I believe that the, the one of the frontiers of paramedic medicine is ultrasound. I like it. And this is going to be one yep. of the easiest ultrasounds that you could do on the rig for a child is you just literally place the probe. This was done by an emergency department. There's not a radiologist, but by a, a, a pediatric ER doctor put the probe on the belly and found this. And what this is, is this is what's called a target sign. So that is an intussusception where the, the, the intestine is involuted on itself. And you're actually seeing that. Um, and, and as time goes on, paramedics are gonna become more and more diagnosticians. It's a very, very easy, uh, easy exam. Now I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Peel. He has a different sense of, of, a, of a different patient presenting with something similar and is gonna make some other really, really important teaching points with his case. Yeah, good, yeah, we're gonna show you a continuum here of, of sickness. I wanted to address a couple of these really cool comments coming in. One was, um, well, does she sleep in that position normally? Great question. And do y'all feel she's a little tachypnea? Now there's a hard one. What is tachypnea in a child? And if you look at the Hantevi app or the Braslo, the, any pediatric reference standard, um, there, was, there, there will be a range of respiratory rate. And it's something we forget to, to measure and count on our own. And this child's respiratory, respiratory rate was in the 30s. How in the world do you know if that's tachypnic for a child? I don't know that Peter or David can give you a firm answer. I'll give you my suggestion. My rough rule of thumb is the 10, 20, 30 rule. So adults are somewhere between, between 10 and 20. Little kids, school-age kids, are somewhere between 20 and 30 and babies somewhere between 30 and 40 at rest normally. And then the 20, 40, 60 rule applies for tachypnea. Uh, babies over 60, school-age kids over 40, and adults over 20. This kid falls somewhere in the middle there, and yet it was a great observation. Is 34 tachypnic, is, there a, is that a sign of shock, bowel obstruction, uh, pain that we need to pay attention to? Very subtle sign, just a great question. Um, I don't know that I have a firm answer on that on that respiratory rate rule, Peter or David. If you do, I'd welcome it. Yeah, I think those, that's great. Uh, you know, I still use either you know hand heavy or I have a card. I still use I still use my card. It's one of the few things I carry around to remind me at the age of twelve months this is the normal range, and I'm always paying attention to vital signs. But every single patient. Agreed. And the comment I'll make is. I, I like to look at the type of breathing we're talking about, right? If someone is having a metabolic acidosis and they're, they're just breathing off that CO2 to compensate, that's a different kind of respiratory rate than if you have someone who's got significant asthma, who's pulling, who's tugging. Um, and so I think that when you're, when you're septic or you're, you're in shock and you're breathing a little faster, it could be a little hard to pick up. And oftentimes in EMS now, we're throwing on the end title it's below 25, that's a, that's a pretty clear sign that you may have an, an elevated lactate. So um, yep. the type of breathing and the pattern, I think, is very important to pick up here. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then there was another uh, great question or comment. Kids with inosusception can have a low heart rate due to visceral, visceral response or tachy. Heart rate's the most important vital sign. This kid isn't that tachycardic. The one I'm going to show you is a bit more. But if the heart rate is pretty high... Or then, or subsequently becomes low, it should it should raise your eyebrows a little bit. So, those are awesome questions. Any others, Hillary? You've seen come in before I go to the next case. Um, no, but just a question about the infectious quality here. Are we always going to see signs of sepsis or infection um, in a kid with intussusception? No, you mean it could be it could be certainly subtle. Okay. Uh, you know, if sepsis were happening in this child in a sleeping position, I probably would expect the child's heart rate to be a little bit higher. Okay. Uh, but um, definitely something to be uh, thinking about. Yeah, I think a lot of us are starting to um, head towards using end title as a uh, you know way to to look at sepsis a little bit. But um, yeah. yeah, go ahead, Mark. And, 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 and Mark, actually, before you get to your, to your case, I just want to mention one more clinical thing that's very important here, which is as David mentioned the the actual bowel is telescoped into itself, and, and Mark's going to show you something like that in a minute, but it turns out that when the outer bowel squeezes on the inner bowel, that's why these kids have these sudden and severe pain, and then when it lets go, 
that's when the body releases its endogenous morphine, endogenous endorphins, if you will. Wow. And that puts the kid right to sleep. So they go from this screaming, screaming pain to going right back to sleep, as David mentioned earlier. That's the question you have to ask. And you have to ask it in that way. And the parent says, yes, that's exactly what happened. That's when you start to understand what potentially you're dealing with here. So go ahead, Mark. Sorry to take that. Exactly. No, no, that's super helpful. And so subtle signs, pay attention to the heart rate and the vital signs. And that, that, that question about endogenous, endogenous endorphins being released in severe interception is a really fascinating one. And I'm going to get into that here in a second. So here's a somewhat similar case. I'll show you a video in a minute. This is a six month old baby with a day of vomiting and abdominal distension and uh, just not acting right, according to the mom. And this um, is the blanket she brought in or that we first saw in the hospital of the vomit. So I hope that coloring is coming across well to you guys. We often wonder, is that bilious vomit or not? This is it, bright green, almost fluorescent. In a baby, this is a point I want you to take home is, this is a surgical emergency until proven otherwise. This. Even if the kid is looking okay, there's something really, really wrong here if you see this green vomit. It's not to be delayed. You get straight to the hospital where it can be dealt with, where we can do the test and the surgery that needs to be done. When, 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 when we have that, is it, Peter, do you recommend that, the, that, that EMS bring, maybe brings that in or the mother brings that in to show the doctor? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, <laughs> what do you, I know it's kind of gross, I, but like, do you recommend that? Like, what do you, what? You could, al you could also take a picture. <laughs> um, yeah. That would but yeah, matter. I mean, but yeah, th this this is very this is very important. O oftentimes, oftentimes we 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 get things on the scene, we hear things, we see things, we smell things. When we get to the emergency department, everything's already cleaned up and everything. We it, we need to see this somehow in some shape or form. Yes. Yeah. But I I do want to say something funny. As parents do like to to show to show me their kids' bowel movements in the diapers. You know they. <laughs> Like, wait, Dr. Spiro, you know, I, I need to show you the diaper. And so, you know, and then I'm like, you know, I don't really need to see it. So anyway, go ahead. Yeah. And Sorry. someone said, this looks like rotavirus diarrhea. This is vomit and it's green and that's bad. And we need to do something right away. Okay. This isn't the school. Um, is here's the baby. You notice the belly is very distended, very distended. And the tongue is green. That's interesting. There's been green vomit coming up for quite a while. I'm um, actually, I can't show this child's entire face, but he, he's awake and he has a green tongue and a distended belly. Now watch, I'm going to examine his belly. I'm going to give a, a, a gentle pressure um, right before we put him to sleep in the OR because we know what's going on and I'll tell you how in a minute. But the, the fascinating appearance of a child with advanced intussusception is what I call apathy. It's not necessarily lethargy. This child is awake, looking around, unconcerned that there's 20 medical providers in a bright room swirling around, putting in IVs, doesn't bother him. But when I touch his belly, watch what happens. Oh, sorry, here's the x-ray, shows some distension. Here's the baby. He didn't mind the IV placement. He didn't mind the, the, the chaos in there, but just touching his belly gently produced a lot of pain. And you noted before, as David had mentioned, his legs were drawn up before he got his first dose of narcotic. Legs mm -hmm. were drawn up as if there's something going on in the belly. So this is evidence of a bowel obstruction and even more evidence potentially of intussusception, that intermittent crampy abdominal pain, drawing the legs up, belly distension, and then the bilious vomiting. We've got to do something now. But, but um, any, I want to make this exam? Mark, I want to want to make a point about this. Just even the still picture without the video, right? Uh, the for, yeah. the first few seconds of the video, five seconds general appearance. You walk into a scene as a as a paramedic, and you see a kid that's lying like this on the on the gurney that's not moving much. Who's this age? What is this? A twelve month old as well? Six, uh, it's a six. It's a big six month old. Yeah, a okay, big six month old. But this kid should be moving. You know, there should be yes. activity. If yes. the child is awake. The child should be moving the extremities, making eye contact. We're not seeing the eyes here, but this child's position and that general appearance, that first five seconds does not seem right. There should be a visceral response to the, everyone that's watching this, this, this lecture today, this talk, 
that this child is not acting correct from the first second you're looking at the kid. Sick. Can yep. I share a quick story about this? Yes, please. Second. So, um, right, like you remember your big misses and I missed in a susception and a four month old as a intern, um, which was a while ago at this point. But this is where you get the history of when the parents say that something isn't right, you have to listen to it. And the clinical history was a mother, a young mother came in with her four month old and she says, in her, like episodic, like every once in a while, I call her name and she doesn't respond to her name. And I'm thinking, do four month olds respond to their name, right? But really what she was talking about is that intermittently her child was not responding appropriately to her. And I focused on like not responding to name. And so this patient was evaluated by attending. I was a first year, um, she was, she took a bottle, she was discharged. And the next day she presented with bloody bowel movements from her ischemic bowel. And I never forgot, right? So there's this classic presentation of, is there belly pain? But in the very young, it can be what you see, what brings people in is the story of the baby is not intermittently not responding the way that they're supposed to. And if I had listened more to the mother and really dove into what she meant by saying the baby's not responding to her name, right? I would have had an increased suspicion for something bad. It was really subtle. Um, but that was sort of a key thing where like, that was the case that taught me, you always listen to the parents and you really dive in Absolutely. when they say something is not right, right? They spend 24 hours a day with this child. When they say something's not right, you need to take that really, really seriously and investigate. Right. So, so search in, in, in altered mental status in children into susception is, is something we think about with kids who have uh, altered mental status. I want to say, first of all, Maya, thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, it's very brave of you to do that. And uh, it's, a, it's really a great uh, clinical pearl. But I think it's also worth mentioning that early interception doesn't have this kind of tenderness, right? So Mark, I know, I know that you're, you're calling this advanced interception. Can you clarify for everybody that early versus late, the difference yes. in the clinical exam on the app? Yes. So early on, the bowel is intermittently obstructing. A part of the bowel is getting sucked into a subsequent part. I'll show you that live in a minute. But there is intermittent, crampy, severe abdominal pain that the child obviously can't describe if they're nonverbal. But they may have these episodes of crying or then being quiet and not responding. And why that exactly happens, I don't know that any of us really know. I think uh, the, the, the woman that commented, uh, I think it was Kathleen, on endorphin release is i think right there's something unusual that happens when that bowel obstructs but then it may release and unobstruct spontaneously and the child goes back to looking to relatively normal when it becomes fixed in place then the bowel becomes ischemic and ultimately dies and the child will develop peritonitis and sepsis and so we want to catch this before that's happening um maya you mentioned blood bloody current jelly stools are supposedly what you see in the textbook i've rarely seen that but the bowel becomes ischemic, dies, and then blood isn't seen in the stool. And that's a far progressed into susception. Um, love some of these pediatric pearls. Number, my number one, as I mentioned, is heart rate is the most important vital sign. This kid's heart rate is 144, and he is febrile in contrast to the previous patient. So febrile to kipnic, heart rate 144, cap refill 3 to 4, there's something going on. Pediatric pearl number two is always listen to mom. And Maya, thank you for bringing that up. Like there are subtle signs in the baby. There's subtle signs in what the mom and or the dad are saying. And then lastly, altered mental status. You, if, if I could show you the full face here, you'd see the child is wide awake. But as everyone pointed out, it's not normal that he's wide awake and not fussy in this situation. So he does have an altered mental status. It's just an unusual form that I think interception uniquely produces. Mark, why, why, does he, why does he have a shoulder roll and why do I see that? I, I see a handle that he's about to be intubated. Is he seeing the OR? Is that why? This is we've taken him to the OR now. So this is pre. This is uh, right before induction in the OR for his surgery. Gotcha. Um, and you may wonder why we we usually reduce uh, in the susception with an air or contrast enema, right? You do that in the ER all the time. This one is way advanced, and the way we mark that. Yes. Hold on, Mark. Please, please, um, please explain that a little bit uh, further because we we know what that means, but a lot of people don't. So the kids in the ER, he's got a simple interception, and then go yeah. ahead. So what we do is we do an x-ray first, and you, you don't have to be, 
This isn't about x-ray interpretation, but there's a hallmark sign of bowel obstruction here, which is a single distended loop. We should see lots of air throughout the belly. There's this big dilated loop of bowel. Something's wrong. Something's twisted or obstructed. We got to figure it out. So then usually an ultrasound is the next um, test. And here we see that the, the middle section is the um, dead bowel stuck within a larger loop of bowel and it's surrounded by fluid. So the large loop that's measuring 35 millimeters is the is the the healthy bowel and the other bowel has gotten sucked into it because of a lead point which i'll describe in a minute but on ultrasound we diagnose that there's bowel obstruction this is classic for intussusception and we would actually have the radiologist inject air or and sometimes um, contrast into the rectum and that would reduce or push apart this obstructed bowel and usually that fixes the problem so I'm guessing in David's case, where the child wasn't far progressed, that was a successful intervention. Whereas here, when you see swelling and ischemia of the bowel, and I didn't show you this part, but this bowel is not perfused on ultrasound, we know that the child has to go straight to the OR to have an open reduction, meaning the surgeon has to fix this. You don't want to let it get this far down the path before, before uh, fixing it. Does that help, Peter? Oh, that was perfect. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate that. Okay. So... Um, I'm showing you the extreme case, but it's what we want to prevent getting to. We don't want these children to have to have surgery. So what I'm going to show you now is the surgeon, uh, my surgeon and friend, um, Dr. Phillips here has opened the belly with a small incision. And what you see currently is healthy bowel. And now he's going to pull out the obstructed bowel. So we'll see what this actually looks like. You never want to hear a surgeon say, wow. There's a good one. There's a good one. And then you can use that to grip it. Uh, it's even bigger. Look at that, Mark. Sterile shoehorn, please. No. Okay, so he pulls it out, and this is what it looks like. And if you haven't seen bowel, you don't know that that's abnormal. But that's three, four times its size, and we'll show you what the anatomy within that is. But basically, part of the bowel has telescoped within itself and caused ischemia and obstruction. And Mark, is there that, you go. can you go back to that? Oh, go ahead. Here's the normal bowel diameter here, right? We still look at the uh, intersection is hemorrhagic here. And then just... So then he cuts this part out, and this is what it looks like. This is what happens to your bowel when it, it remains obstructed. And that was probably soon to rupture and was probably already contributing to some early sepsis. That, pro that child probably was back, becoming bacteremic and sick. So signs of shock would ultimately have been the next stage if that hadn't been reduced immediately. Thoughts so, uh, before uh, I go on to the next? Yeah, Mark, just, just, just explain the bacteremia. So you have dead bowel, and then you have lots of blood vessels there, and you have a lot of bacteria, obviously, in the bowel. So that combination of dead bowel, a lot of vasculature and bacteria, that bacteria then finds its way into the bloodstream, and then voila, we have sepsis. Correct. So normally our bowel is rightly full of bacteria, and our immune system and the, the barriers within the bowel protect us from getting those in the bloodstream. But if blood flow is compromised by injury or obstruction or any number of appendicitis, any number of things that can cause inflammation and obstruction in the bowel, then those bacteria can leak across the membranes that normally protect us get into the bloodstream and cause sepsis. So that's what we're trying to avoid here and treat. And Mark, how did this uh, patient do? What was his outcome? Let me show you the next little video here, Hillary, then I'll tell you. Okay, so what you're about to see is the reduction. This is, this is the live reduction of an intussusception. So you actually see what's happening. This is rare footage that we get to understand um, in real time how this happens. That had intussuscepted into the distal bowel and then come out here. So this is the head of the intussusception. So as we pull back, you can push that, Emily, and I'll pull back here. Here's where it had intussuscepted it. And see, it's all purplish and hemorrhagic and infarcted. You see how it's dead? It's coming back out. Yes. That's the undoing of an intussusception. Yes. We're watching it live. And it looks like an idiopathic area of thickening of the bowel right here. Maybe just a viral illness. There's no medical diversity. Okay. So that shows you what happened inside in reverse. 
that bowel was clipped out, reanastomosed, baby went to the ICU, got antibiotics and fluids for a few days, and, and did well. So this was caught. But an abdominal catastrophe, meaning a peritonitis and sepsis, could be the result if this wasn't caught in time. Got it. So that, that's kind of our lesson. Subtle signs of, of life-threatening illnesses lurking within the belly. And so do these... Some- Sometimes do these cause, uh, or sorry, require a bowel resection? Yeah, and this one did. So in this okay. picture, um, you can see that part of it's already been cut in half. So, so a good section of that was was in fact resected. That's rarely the case in the interceptions we can reduce um, in, from the ER. But when they progress to surgery, they may often need to be fully resected. And sort of what and are it, the top causes of interception? That's a good question. Usually it's a viral illness causing inflammation of the little immune patches within the bowel. This child had a, um, a small benign growth on the, on the bowel wall that served as a lead point. It was almost like, it's almost like imagine a snake swallowing a rat and propelling it through itself as it digests. If there's a, if there's a bump with, or a, a mm-hmm. growth or a mass in the bowel, the, the body interprets that as something to propel forward and it happens to suck more of the bowel inside with it and then causes the obstruction. Great. It's a and very strange process. Yeah. The, for those folks using it, ultrasound, like Sean, um, he asked, would, would this patient tolerate an ultrasound on the belly or would he squirm so much? Um, sorry? Would, would this patient tolerate ultrasound uh, probe oh, yeah. on the belly? Absolutely. Okay. You don't, you don't have to apply hardly any pressure to do an adequate ultrasound. Got it. Okay. Absolutely. And then um, um, are they, that, go ahead, Mark, just, I'm just reading the questions as they come in. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, if they get it once, are they more susceptible? Do you see what I did there? Yeah, probably this child ended up having something that was resected. So unlikely to happen again, but kids can okay. get it twice. Okay. Uh, don't know the answer to that. Any, any other pediatric or other experts on the phone yeah. want to talk about how common this is and how often it recurs? I could, I could say that whenever we have a patient who has an interception and we reduce it and we send the parent home, we, we give, and, and now, and now we do that, right? We used to keep them overnight and, and now it all depends on the kid. But if we send the kid home, we, we tell the parent, remember that constellation of symptoms, exactly the screaming, the going to sleep, the, the rolling up of the legs. If that happens again, you got to come right back in. The other comment I'll make is that in over 22 years of pediatric ER, I mean, getting to this is not that common, at least not in my practice, where, um, you know, if you catch it early, I mean, we see lots of interception, but we don't see the interception that requires your OR too commonly, maybe a handful of times in my entire career. Good. And then last question, and we can move on to the next case. Do adults ever get this? Hmm. They do. They do, Maya. (laughs) They do, but it's it, they do, but it's uh, very rare. Okay. Um, so occasionally, and actually, in adults, occasionally you'll have something read as in a susception, for example, on a CT scan, which is something that we do in adults. That's not necessarily clinically significant, unless they have other signs of obstruction. But um, I have not diagnosed that many clinically significant in a susceptions in adults, and I take care of about ninety five percent of adults and five percent kids, and I have diagnosed multiple in susceptions in kids. Great. All right, David, over to you for more abdominal that, emergencies. That was incredible footage. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you never I see that, so by the way. It. Yeah, it's hard. We can't envision often what's actually going on inside of the body um, in some of these conditions. And ultrasound helps that, I believe, in the, but actually watching the surgery live, irreplaceable, yes. Uh, okay, um, let me just actually uh, get out of the screen. So this is a 13-month-old um, presenting um, essentially inconsolable for the last couple days um, in a febrile. So let's let's just roll this because this this will bring up a couple. Of this is Leo. Dad, how old is Leo? Thirteen months. Okay. And how long has Leo been having this problem with his belly? Since he's been born. Since he's been born. Okay. Since he's been born. Since he's been born. Since he's been born. And you said he's been to a couple different. Not stop crying for the last day or two, inconsolable, with a very distended belly. And every time you press the belly, the child is is, inc- is, is incredibly uncomfortable, and the and the and the pitch of the cry gets a little bit higher. Doctors to try and figure out what's been going on. Yeah. 
Have any x-rays been done besides the one we did here today? Yes, uh, he had some from the emergency room, okay. and uh, but they say they just have he just have that. Okay. Did he ever have any kind of barium studies when they put anything in his bottom? To see what his colon looks like? No. Okay. And how often does he normally do that? Like every three days. Okay. And how long has it been since he pooped today? Uh, this the six. Six days. Mm -hmm. Five days since he pooped. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. So no, no stool for five or six days. Again, getting a really good history like Maya talked about is really, really important. Is this child sick or not sick? I think that's the first question. And the kid is sick. Why is this kid sick? Why? What, what, what about when you just see this kid for the first 30, 50, 45 seconds and hearing that cry? What about this patient makes you think this kid is sick? Yeah, weighing in on the chat, lots of people um, saying he's sick. Um, the fact that he's tender, um, the distension, again, the no bowel movement in six days, his positioning. David and Hillary, you know what's really hitting me is that this poor dad, right? He's been oh. dealing with this for so long. He's calm because he's dealt with this for, for a long time now. His kid's crying, this that scream that just, you know, uh, you know, raises every hair on your arm. Yeah. And these parents just oftentimes, unfortunately, if, they, if they're not getting the right advice or care, will just, they'll go back home and they'll just deal with it and deal with it and deal with it. And the other other thing is that, I'm not sure if it's the same doctor as the last time, but but he, he's asking all, the same guy? Different, different, oh, different. Different. He's asking the right questions. And I'm not sure if people picked up on the fact that he said, did your child ever get a barium study where they put barium in, in his bottom? I mean, he knows what's going on. I'm sure we're going to get to that in a minute, but it's, it's really, this is where understanding age, diagnosis, and then understanding the questions to ask because he's almost like leading the witness. Whereas if he didn't know what was going on, didn't have the right question to ask. So that's why everyone listening today needs to go back open the textbook on these, and I'm not gonna tell you what this is yet, but you'll open the textbook, learn about it now that you've seen it, and then it'll gel together so that you never miss this ever again. Yeah, and so many of our viewers are saying that the cry is really note noteworthy. It's high pitched, it's it's a type of cry that's more scary than than a, a regular cry, so very good. I think that's one good. really interesting part of the history here is where he says it's essentially been since he was born. And very often in EMS, we think, oh, it's a chronic condition, right? And then we decrease the probability. But one, we have to be careful about doing that. But especially in children, one of the best advice I ever got from um, one of my attendings and residents, he was, children haven't proven to you that they've been put together right. Right. So like by the time you get to an adult, right, they've, for the most part, right, every once in a while, we still discover that things have been put together funny, but children have not put together that, you know, all the basic things are put together in the right, right way um, and in a functional way. And so presence since birth um, has a pretty significant effect on what the differential diagnosis may be and is a really important question and shouldn't make it so that you're less worried about any significant illness, but it just changes the direction of the differential. I'm stealing that as a new pediatric pearl, Maya. I love it. It's a great pearl. Um, it's a great pearl. My, Maya, it, it's almost like when someone comes to you in the ER and says, I've had a headache for seven years and you immediately like, oh God, here we go. Right. So you gotta, you gotta not, you gotta not fall into that hole. <laughs> okay. So this case was actually uh, created in rural North Carolina, by the way. So not far from where Dr. Peel resides. Um, it, I'm just curious, Peter, if this, if, if you have an inconsolable child, um, What's the approach from a pain standpoint? Because again, the difference here is that this isn't a 23-year-old with abdominal pain. And if we get to it, well, I want to show you a 23-year-old with abdominal pain who can tell you exactly where his pain is, when it started, and how much pain he is on a scale of zero to 10. Uh, here, we're rely relying upon the exam, uh, inconsolable, and that feeling that is uncomfortable, high-pitched cry, some folks have said, and maybe some vital signs. 
how are we going to address the pain from a pre-hospital standpoint in a, in a, in a, in a 13 month old? Yeah, no, th this is a great question. And I think that um, you, know, you, you hear the, the chronicity of this issue, but obviously this kid's in a lot of pain. More than likely, you know, we'll, we'll start off in the ER, we'll get a little pacifier, we'll dip it in some sugar water, we'll, we'll, we'll see if just we can console the kid by just getting a taste of something sweet and seeing that if, if that's working. But obviously, personally, if I see that there's a kid in a lot of pain and I'm touching his abdomen, I mean, obviously I'm making sure that he's uh, stable enough to get pain control as far as, you know, giving him fluids and so forth, but this kid's going to get pain control. He needs pain control, period, end of story. Uh, you're let's, going, let's... You're going in an ambulance where there's going to be rocking and movement. And this child, I could tell you, anytime this child was moved, the hot, the, the pitch of the cry got uh, worse. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, we would all say that this kid, if we, if, if we were given a pain scale, we would say he's got a 10, right? So show me anywhere in the world where you would say someone has a 10 and then you look at their EMS report and it says not given pain control. It, unless there's a really good reason not to give pain control, we owe it to our, our folks to give them pain control. Intranasal, intramuscular, start an IV. Heck, nowadays people are using nebulized ketamine, right? And there's no excuse anymore, uh, in my opinion. So David David asked, what, what would be your favorite opioid for this kid during transport? And would it depend if it was a longer transport or a shorter transport? Or ketamine, don't forget about ketamine. Right, well, listen, we, we, only, we have fentanyl, that's our primary go-to. Um, and, and, and I know a lot of people, have, some people have morphine as you're seeing it less and less. You know, yes, some people have, a lot of people are starting to use ketamine, but obviously this kid's younger. Most people use the 100 milligram per ml concentration of ketamine. You try and dose up 0.25 mg per kilo, it's gonna be 0 0.0 something ml. So it's not really so uh, um, ideal to, to pull out the most concentrated form of ketamine and try and give it to an infant. So word to the wise, just very, be very cautious. You should be diluting your ketamine if you're gonna give it to a kid of this age, but fentanyl will work here perfectly well. I would not go to ketamine in this particular kid. I do think fentanyl is the best choice here. One mic per kilo, reassess the patient. That should, that should do it. Or, or two mics per kilo intranasal. 1.5 to 2 intranasal good, is what, is what, is what uh, if, if, I, if it was me, that's what I'd be using right now. Yeah. And how about fluids from a pre-hospital standpoint? 10 per kilo, 20 per kilo? 20 per kilo. Yeah, 20, 20 per kilo, unless, unless we have you know, any suggestion not to. But if you think about it, he's 10 kilos. 20 per kilo is 200 ml is nothing. Um, and with the, with, with the fact, again, I don't know the rest of his, his, his exam here, cap refill and so forth. But, um, uh, you know, in my opinion, it's, it's 20 per kilo unless proven otherwise, especially in a kid with an abdominal emergency that, that surely looks like he's going to need uh, a surgical intervention or at least a, uh, an assessment by a surgeon. Let's put it that way so we can get him diagnosed. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, his capillary refill was two to three seconds. So a little bit, you know, right on the edge there. Um, has not been taking really, really good uh, uh, POs in the last couple of days since he's been so inconsolable. Um, what, do you, what are you all seeing on his, uh, his plane film? Anyone want to comment? Not sure there are many radiologists here, David. <laughs> Peter, Mark, what are you seeing? I mean, I do see one big dilated loop. It, it's it's overall dilated. There's probably a lot of fluid and air mixed together. I don't know that I, I don't know what I'd make of it to be to be totally honest. I think from his exam, he has peritonitis. Yeah. He, something's not right, and and I think you're going to get to this, David, but. What we're showing here is that multiple conditions can ultimately lead to the condition of peritonitis where there's bacteria outside the bowel wall that eventually gets in the bloodstream. So this is becoming an emergency. It's, it's a, a non-emergency turning into an emergency from a chronic condition he has. Yeah, well, so not sure I'd make a ton from that x-ray other than it doesn't look right. And I want to do, I need a little more investigation, David. Yeah, so, and, and I appreciate that. He could have had lots of different things, but it turns out he had what's called Hirschsprung's disease 
which is the failure of the development of the last part of the uh, large intestine or the around the anus and rectum. And um, he wasn't able to poop essentially or open up his bowel at the end. And, um, and he'll, you know, ultimately that needs a surgical correction. So this is a surgical emergency, especially with the amount of abdominal distension that, that he went and he ended up going to a quaternary care, tertiary care hospital, pediatric hospital and, 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 and was, had, had to be managed by a pediatric surgeon. And had a full so, 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 David, I, I, just, just, to, just, so I could say it in, in a way, in, in a different way for everybody, is that there, there's so many kind of, there's a lot of wiring that's in your, in your gut, right? Your gut affects everything, and that wiring, you know, obviously during the fact that he was in utero, the wiring didn't make it all the way down, and there's that very last segment of his colon that just wasn't working like the rest of it was. So. The, you know, everything comes down and, uh, you know, his, his, he, he's trying to have a bowel movement. But when it gets to the very end, he's basically got nothing there that can actually squeeze it right on through. And so that, that small segment at the very end has to be removed. Um, and this is, this, is, this is not a, like an inconsequential diagnosis. This is serious stuff. And what's um, the ultimate um, fix? Are they, um, you said uh, removing part of that intestine, but what happens eventually in terms of living life? You basically so, remove, you know, go, go ahead, David, yeah. Now, some of these children can do fine. Uh, uh, frankly, many of them ultimately do suffer from chronic constipation because things are typically not right. And so sometimes they have to have other surgeries or they have to be managed with laxatives or, uh, enemas or other things. So sometimes these children have a complete recovery, depending on how severe the disease is, and sometimes they just end up suffering with, um, with, 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 you know, with with these issues that continue to remain. Got it. Okay. All right. Why don't we Why don't we just present one last patient? Yeah, let's uh, do it. We talked about the kids. This is an older kid, which is actually an adult, but let is a twenty three year old. But let's let's roll this, and maybe we can kind of end it with with a discussion here. Good evening, Stephen. What prompted the 911 phone call tonight? Sure, pain in my right stomach. Okay. And when did that start? Around lunchtime. Okay. And where, when the pain started, where did you feel it? Can you point? Right side of my belly button. Okay. And where do you feel the pain now? Great. Does he see comfortable or uncomfortable? Sick or not sick, right? And then he just generally pointed, I often ask, I often actually tell the child, I hold the hand and say, with one finger point, where, where is that pain? Because I want to know exactly where that pain is, as opposed to this or this. Sometimes I'll ask for one finger. So I'm going to pull your shirt up here a little bit so I can feel and look at your stomach. Tell me where it hurts. Any pain there? And how, when I let go, any pain? There. And one of the things I really appreciate about this exam is, is this uh, paramedic actually pressed relatively deep. And I think one of the uh, um, uh, learning opportunities as you develop your career is to not be ginger about it. You can actually press relatively deep, even into a child's abdomen to elicit uh, peritoneal pain and get that rebound tenderness. Because if you're too superficial, you may not elicit that that kind of pain. Oh, I like it. I love, I love how he's doing the rebound here. Uh, for the, for the young EMS folks on the line, this is he's doing a really good job. Okay, he just said it. He said one of the things that I really look for, uh, if if for appendix specifically for appendicitis, which is usually right lower quadrant, is the Rav Singh sign which is you press in the left lower quadrant and it elicits pain in the right lower quadrant. And that's often a very telltale sign that the patient has a surgical emergency around appendicitis. And then Remember, left, pressing on the left causes referral to the right. And I'm gonna push here. And did it hurt worse when I let go or did? Okay. All right. And bowel movements and urination have been normal? Yes. Okay. Any problems with appendicitis 
or any abdominal conditions, no problems, no past medical history, no diabetes, hypertension. I get a sense that every time that that ambulance goes over a bump, he's uncomfortable. And that's actually a question I ask the children when they come in. Was, was it painful when you came in by car or ambulance? And, 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 and David, you want to just stop it for a second? We, I, I get questions all the time is, Doc, this person has abdominal pain. Do you want us giving pain control? Yeah. <laughs> because this, this, this myth of many, uh, of maybe a surgeon or two that weren't being nice, but absolutely a thousand percent, we need to give pain control for this guy, right? And so gone are the days of it's abdominal pain and we're not gonna give pain control. That is just not true. It's not true, period. All right. Any abdominal surgeries in the past? Just a hernia, no problems with hernias or anything? All right. Well, thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to add as far as what's been going on today? Does that pretty much cover everything? Okay. Well, thank you for letting us take this video. All right, so we're wrapping it up and Peter and Mark, everyone knows that I like to end on time. But uh, any any pearls, Peter, Mark, Maya, any thoughts about this case that you want to add? I just We want to throw this in at the end because uh, this patient ended up having acute appendicitis that was not perforated and uh, and did well. Um, any, any, any quick yeah. change before we end? The comments, the, the comments I would make is that, you know, if, if the guy's in pain, I would say, you know, hey, I see that you're in a lot of pain. I'm so sorry. I'm going to work to make this better, number one. You know, I mean, if, if you know this is appendicitis or you think it's going to require some intervention, then, then, then definitely start to prime this guy for what's about to happen in the, in the emergency department. You know, one, one, once you know what it is and you're doing what you're doing, start to connect with the patient feel their pain, understand they're having pain, talk to them, is there anything I can do for you? We're about to drop you off, you're gonna get great care at the hospital. Those are the important things that people will remember. They won't remember that you started an IV on them. They won't remember that you gave fentanyl to them. So be, be human and just keep doing the great work you guys are doing in the field. And David, amazing uh, job today, you guys, you're awesome. Thank you so much. And Mark and Maya, and I, I wanna point out, you know, Maya said something. She was a little vulnerable today about a case. We all have cases that go well, sometimes cases that don't go well. There, there are always opportunities for improvement. And man, this was a great episode. And I learned so much from, from, from all of you all and really appreciated the interactive questions. Uh, so uh, honored to work with everyone today.